Hello everybody, I'm just going to give you a little explanation of the configuration spaces of points, which is the topic of the dance film that I posted alongside this video. The idea is that the dance film is an intuitive, artistic understanding of the configuration spaces of points, and in this video it will be more of a mathematical, rigorous understanding, uh, so you can, have, you can use both sides of your brain. Uh, what does this look like, or what is this object? I'm just going to take a copy of R2, so this is my two-dimensional plane right here, and I'm going to put a certain number of points in it. So for this example, I'm going to choose three points, and I have three colors, red, blue, and yellow. And I plop my three points down in the plane just like that. And we're going to be concerned with all of the different possible configurations of these three points in the plane. We denote the space C, O, and F for a configuration. We put the K to say there's K points. And then we put R2 to say we're looking at points in R2. And this space consists of all ordered k tuples of points in R2. So we have a list of k points in R2, and we want to make sure that two points are not the same if they have different indices. And that just makes sure that our points are distinct. In this space, we care about which point is where. So it's like we have labeled points uh, A, B, and C. And uh, if we switch A and B, that's going to be a different configuration of our points, even if the list of numbers is the same up to a permutation. On the other hand, we could have the unordered configuration space, and this is where we erase the labels of our points, and we just care about the set of points in the plane, not necessarily the order. So this is denoted uconf sub k of r2. The u stands for unordered. And the description is going to be the same, except for I'm going to put set brackets so that we can see that the order of these points, A1 to AK, does not matter. Um, another way that we can write the unordered configuration space is as the ordered configuration space modded out by an action of the symmetric group. And that action is, of course, just a permutation of the points. So this is what we're going to be studying today. Uh, let's establish a few facts about this space to start off with. First thing you might notice that we have k points, and each of them is a point in R2. And so that's 2 times k dimensions. So both uh, conf and uconf are 2k dimensional spaces. In order to understand the configuration space, we have a leveling up of abstraction. So we have the two-dimensional plane down here with our points in it. And then up in some other world, we have this auxiliary space, which is the configuration of all of those points. And so we can think about the correspondence between elements of the auxiliary configuration space up here and what that actually looks like down on the ground in our plane. Let me get a little bit more space. Yeah. So on the one side, we have uh, the, uh, the configuration space. And on the other side, we have the downstairs space, R2, with K points. 
And so on this side, at point in here, is going to correspond to a configuration of three points in the plane. So that corresponds to to a list of k coordinates in R2, either ordered or unordered, depending on which space up here we're talking about. And then we also have a path over here. So this is if you start at one point in the configuration, and then you make a continuous path to another point. And this corresponds to taking all of the k points in the downstairs plane and moving them all around at the same time. And we're going to call this a dance of the points, of course. And then, more specifically, we can have a loop over here. A loop is a path which starts and ends at the same point. And in the downstairs space, that corresponds to a dance which starts and ends in the same position. And uh, whether that position is the same exactly or the same up to permutation of the points depends on whether we're looking at the configuration space, which is ordered, or the unordered configuration space. Well, I wanted to give you a few reasons for why you might be interested in this space. Uh, for one, if you saw my dance film, you uh, saw how we could use the configuration space of points to keep track of a collection of autonomous entities moving around in a space. By that, I mean a collection of dancers on a stage, a collection of animals in an enclosure, a collection of Roombas in a living room, <laughs> or a collection of particles in a box or something like this. So we have applications for dancing, or more specifically, or more, more generally, modeling something. Modeling things in a space, whatever those things might be. Um, a more specific application is that you might imagine a collection of robots who can move up and down a track that's embedded in the floor. Maybe the track looks something like this. So this is a graph in the plane. And my robots, you could imagine, I have three robots, and they can only stay on these lines. So maybe these are my three robots. And I want to ask the question, if I start in this configuration, can I get to some other configuration? So maybe I want to get from this position of my robots to this one. And the question of whether I can do that is a question of whether there exists a path from this point to this point in the configuration space of the robots on this track. Uh, so if this graph is called gamma, capital gamma, then we express this as the configuration space on three points of gamma. So that's another application. And the last application I wanted to discuss has more of a mathematical flavor. So uh, we can identify the plane, R2, the complex plane, just C. And if we have three distinct points in C, we can construct a unique monic polynomial with those three points as roots. What I mean by that is if we're given a 1, a 2, a 3, then we can construct the polynomial PZ as the product of Z minus A1, Z minus A2, and Z minus A3. And this polynomial is going to have a 1 as its leading coefficient, and its three roots are going to be uh, the three points that we started with. So as we take our three points in the complex plane and we move them around, we are actually moving around in the space of monic polynomials of degree 3. Huh. Where else have we seen the space of polynomials? I'll let you figure that one out. But of course, there are many applications of the configuration space to uh, things like the Mandelbrot set and complex polynomial dynamics. Okay, so hopefully these give you some motivation for why we are going to be looking at this space. So let's go ahead and dive into some details of how do we actually think about the configuration space.
And specifically, we're going to look at the case when k equals 3. So like I mentioned earlier, the configuration space is going to be 2 times k dimensional. So in this case, we have a six dimensional space we're trying to understand. And if we look at the space and try to think about every point at the same time, that is a lot of points and it's a huge space and it's difficult for us to see. So instead of looking at the space with geometry, which is keeping track of all of the points, we can look at the space topologically. And what do I mean by that? A lot of times when you look at, um, when you look at a space topologically, you extract some sort of algebraic object from that space, and then you study the algebraic object in order to think about the space. And specifically, we're going to be looking at the fundamental group. So I want to give a brief introduction for uh, the fundamental group in case you haven't seen that before. We're going to use an example space, and we're going to use my favorite space as an example, which is the torus. OK, so here's my torus. I'm going to call it x. So a fundamental, the fundamental group loosely is the group of base loops up to homotopy. What does that mean? Well, first I have to pick a base point which I'm going to call little x. So maybe I'll choose this point right here. And your choice of base point does not matter if your space is path connected. And now we're going to look at all of the loops that start and end at the little x. So maybe we have one loop that looks like that. We could have another loop, which goes around and through the hole in our donut, like that. We could have another loop that goes around the hole, like that one. And those are all loops uh, in the fundamental group. However, every single loop is hard to keep track of because there are uncountably, infin infinitely many of them. So instead, we're just going to look at the loops up to homotopy. What do I mean by that? It's up to wiggling and contracting. So for example, this yellow loop, I can make it smaller and smaller in a continuous way until I'm not really moving away from the point x at all. I'm just staying still. So uh, we say that this yellow loop is null homotopic. On the other hand, the red and the blue loops, if I wiggle them around continuously on the surface of the torus, I won't be able to contract them to the point x, so these two loops are not null homotopic. They're not homotopic to staying still. I want to give you an example of two loops which are homotopic. I'm going to draw another version of the torus for this. Uh, here is our point x, and we could go around the hole like this. We could also go down behind, up, then around, then retrace our steps where we go down and back up to X. So this red loop goes around the outside, through the hole, traverses around the hole once, and then goes back through the hole to go back to x. And I can continuously slide the red loop through the hole of the torus, around the whole shape, and make it look like the blue loop. And so uh, these two loops are homotopic. So let me write down some more technical definitions for what we've talked about in case that helps you. So first is the definition of a loop. We say that a loop is a map from the interval from 0 to 1 to the space x that is continuous and the start and end points are the same and they're both the point x. And then a homotopy is a little bit more difficult to define. 
It's a map from unit square into the torus. So here's the unit square. It's parameterized by 0 to 1 on the top and on the bottom. We want the bottom of the square to be mapped to our first loop and the top of the square to be mapped to our second loop. And then the whole thing needs to be a continuous map. And this is a homotopy from the red loop to the blue loop. So more technically, so we're going to label our loops down here alpha and beta. And then a homotopy is a continuous map from the unit square into x um, so that when we fix the second uh, input at 0, we get alpha of t. When we fix the second input at 1, then we get beta of t. And uh, it has to be a base homotopy, meaning that the endpoints of the loops are always at the point x. And we write that as h of 0 comma s equals h of 1 comma s, which is always the point, little point x. Um, if that is confusing for you, don't worry too much about it. This is just for people who this makes more sense for. So the fundamental group is the group of all loops based at x up to homotopy. So you consider two loops the same if they're homotopic. And you might notice that if I have a loop and I leave the point x and I come back to it, and then I do another loop where I leave x and I come back to it, then doing both of those loops together, I get a loop that starts and finishes at x. And so in that way, combining two loops also gives you a loop. Um, that's one of the group conditions. Um, the identity of the group is just given by staying still at x. If I combine that with any loop, I get the same loop out. And um, the inverse, we have an inverse for every loop, which is just going backwards. So if I go around the red curve and then I go backwards around the red curve, I can move, I can uh, continuously move that turnaround point all the way around the loop until I can contract the loop back to x. Um, so in that way, the base loops of the homotopy really do form a group. And we call that the fundamental group of the space. So we are interested in what is the fundamental group of the configuration space and the unordered configuration space. Let's see if we can figure that out. So remember, we have talked already about what the loops are in the configuration space and the unordered configuration space. In the configuration space, the loops are the dances of the points where each point returns back to its starting position. And in the unordered configuration space, the loops are dances where each point returns to a starting position, not necessarily its own. So let's draw a little picture of what this looks like. We have our two-dimensional plane here. We have our three points. And I'm going to draw a loop in the ordered configuration space. So maybe red goes around this way. Maybe blue goes around this way. And maybe yellow goes around here. But, I mean, in this drawing, you don't know which dot is passing in front of the other one. It gets really confusing. This is a difficult picture to understand. So how can we make this make more sense? How can we understand the loops in the configuration space better? Well, we can do that by looking into the third dimension. So right now, we have a two-dimensional plane. If we think of the, the dance of the points as a movie that's playing and it starts at time 0 and ends at time 1, then we can divide the movie into a whole bunch of frames and lay those frames on top of each other so that the first frame is at the top of the stack and the last frame is at the bottom of the stack. 
And then if we look at the stack with x-ray goggles, we will see the points moving through space as the movie plays. So how can we draw this? We draw one plane at time zero. And another plane at time one. And then we draw our three points up here. And I'm not going to get the same dance as I did up there. That is, um, I'm just going to draw any old dance right now. So there's a little dance of the points. And you can see that when we look into the third dimension, we actually get a braid of strands, because a point times an interval is a line. And of course, the lines are braiding around each other. And so this tells us that the loops in the configuration space both ordered and unordered correspond to braids of three strands when we're looking at k equals three. They just started playing the bells on campus, but I'm just going to keep on talking. It's a nice ambient noise. Um, so we have an intuitive picture of a braid here. Um, formally, a braid is, oh, it's a long formal definition that I don't really want to write out for you guys. But the important thing to know is that a braid on k strands is I start with all the strands arrayed. So maybe I start with, we start with our favorite three strands. So they're attached at these three points. Um, some strand has to come back to the starting positions at the end, but they can, of course, get tangled up however we want in the middle. Um, so this is a braid right here. You might notice that this strand does not end up at its starting place, um, and neither do the other two. I want to add one extra point about the definition for a braid. We also want to require that any horizontal cross-section of the braid contains only one point from each strand. Intuitively, this means strands cannot go down and then back up. Uh, for example, this would not be a braid. So braids actually form a group, which is super nice for us and for a lot of reasons. We're just going to look at the braid group on three strands for right now. So for the group, we need an identity. Well, first of all, we need a uh, group operation, which is I take two braids and I just do one braid and then do the other braid. You imagine like literally braiding strands. You do one and then you do the other one. And that corresponds to stacking them on top of each other. So along with that, we need an identity. And you might guess that the identity braid is just keeping all of the strands fixed. So on three strands, it looks like this. And then we need uh, an inverse for every braid. And the inverse is done by reflecting the braid across the vertical axis. You can imagine literally braiding strands and then just like undoing the braid down below. And what's going to happen is that uh, together you can wiggle the strands while keeping endpoints fixed, and you can straighten them out to look like the identity. Maybe let me just draw a little example of this. Here is a simple braid where I just move the left strand over the right one. The inverse of this is, of course, moving the right strand over the left strand. And it looks like that. And then I can perform a homotopy continuously sliding that uh, leftmost strand over and then straightening those strands out. So every braid has an inverse. And of course, if you uh, compose two braids, if you add one to another, you also have a braid. So those are the conditions we need to form a group. And so we see that. Um, braids actually do form a group. There, we have a couple generators for the braid group.
on three strands, there are two generators, and they look like this. Crossing the left strand over the right one, or the left strand over the middle one, and then crossing the middle strand over the right one. We call these sigma one and sigma two. Um, in general, if I have more strands, so if I have like four strands here, then I would need to add a third generator, which is switching the last two. And I'm going to call that sigma 3. So you can uh, generalize this to the break group on any number of strands. So these braids and their inverses will generate the entire braid group. But that's a little aside, just in case you're interested. The loops in the ordered configuration space correspond to braids where every strand returns to its starting position, like the example that I drew right here. Whereas the unordered configuration space, the loops in the unordered configuration space, correspond to braids where every strand returns to some starting position. So, to draw an example of that, so this would be a braid in the unordered configuration space. Okay, so what is my point here? I realize that if you only prove the items that I mentioned, it shows that this map is a homomorphism between these groups. In order to get an isomorphism, you would also need to show that the map is injective and surjective. So what do I mean by it plays well with the group operation? I mean that if we call this map here phi, then we have phi of um, of alpha times beta in the fundamental group. Is the same as phi of alpha plus phi of beta. So I leave it up to you to check that my claim holds and it makes sense. But after we have shown that, then we see that the fundamental group of the configuration space on k points in R2 is isomorphic to the brain group. And that is pretty cool. Um, as an extension, we have something called the pure braid group, which is exactly the subgroup of the braid group, where every strand returns to its own starting position. And this is, of course, the fundamental group of the unordered configuration space. And we write that pi 1 of comp sub k. is isomorphic to P sub K, and the P just stands for pure break group. So that is all that I wanted to tell you guys about today. I hope that you thought that this was interesting and it gives a little bit more concreteness to the film, the dance film that I made. And um, I encourage you to look up and learn more about configuration spaces because I think that they're really neat. And you might too. Okay, thank you for watching, and as always, keep exploring.